Well, let me say it is an honor to be with you this morning. It's always an honor to be at New Holland Baptist Church. And as I always try to do, I want to bring you a greeting this morning from your sister churches that make up the Chattahoochee Baptist Association around this part of the state. Uh, Eighty other congregations this morning, and they're worshiping in all different uh, sizes and types, all different music styles, several different languages, but they're all worshiping the same Savior. And uh, God bless you guys for being part of it. And it's a joy to partner with you and all these other churches. It's a joy for New Holland to be a partner in the Chattahoochee Baptist Association. Let me ask you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Acts and to the 20th chapter. And if you just kind of hold your finger there for a little bit. How many of y'all this past week, uh, maybe you saw a news story, maybe you saw a documentary uh, about uh, the 80th anniversary for D-Day? Anybody realize that took place this week? Yeah, just like, what, three days ago, the 6th of June, 1944, some 150,000 soldiers from several different countries stormed the, the beaches in Normandy and uh, began to liberate the country of France, opened up a second front in the war against Germany, and it is just a colossal day in history. So I watched some of those documentaries, watched some of those old movies that were on TV that day, and and just remembered that generation, those guys that did that. And as I watched some of those documentaries, maybe you had the same experience. I mean, there were all kinds of times where people would basically say thank you. They would uh, you know, just remember guys who did that. There are not that many that are still alive today that took part, but the ones that are, they would interview somebody, and it was pretty remarkable. But in the midst of all of that, one of the things that was a theme, and maybe you saw the same kind of thing, was a question. Some of the commentators, some of the folks who would interview, or some of the folks in these documentaries would raise the question. Maybe you heard it on talk radio or something. Somebody asked the question, could we still do that today? I mean, as a country, do we still have the moral clarity? Do we still have the kinds of people who could do something like that? If we were faced with a similar challenge today, could we do that again? And you know, I hope the answer is yes. I'm not the expert that can tell you what that answer actually is, but I hope the answer is yes. But people ask those kinds of questions because it's really impossible to look at that event or to interview people from that generation and think about what America was like in that time and, and not realize how much America has changed. And it has changed. I mean, of those 150,000 guys who stormed the beaches in Normandy that day, I don't, uh, most of those, maybe all of those young men had grown up through the Depression, the Great Depression here in the United States. And so they were accustomed to deprivation and hardship in ways that most of us are not. That's a change. And none of that 150,000 guys who stormed the beaches of Normandy that day had grown up in an air conditioned house. None of them probably had ever watched a television. None of them have ever played a video game. It's like it was a different world that they were a part of. America has changed in many, many ways. And many of the ways Americans changed have nothing to do with technology like television or video games. It has to do with values and the kind of communities that we are a part of now. You don't have to go back 80 years. You might go back 50 years. There may be somebody in the house today that we could say that when you went to school, maybe you grew up in this New Holland community, and when you went to school, every other kid in your class, I may not have gone to New Holland Baptist Church, but every other kid in your class went to church somewhere. Just about every other kid in your class lived in a house with his mom and dad. His biological mom and dad. I don't have to, it's no secret. That's not the case for the majority of people today. Your kids, your grandkids are growing up in a country that is vastly different than it was 80 years ago, 50 years ago. In a country that is much more secular. In a country where not only is it true that every kid doesn't go to church somewhere, it is true today that many of the kids that your kids or grandkids are in class with have never been to church and may have no memory of church. And the things that are taught at church are completely foreign to them. Now we see this played out in a hundred ways in American life today. We see it played out in government 
the decisions that are made at the national level. We see it played out in things that are celebrated. And maybe you're like me. Sometimes you look at what's taking place in the news or what the protest of the day is or what's being celebrated in a particular month and things that were unheard of, unthinkable 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And you feel very much like a stranger. Anybody here this morning feel like a stranger when you watch the news? Anybody feel like, you know, that's not the country I grew up in. That's not, the, that's not what I was taught. That's not what we teach at church every Sunday. And in many ways, we all have to understand in today's world that the changes that have taken place mean that for many of us, we are not the home team. Now, the time was, maybe it was true when you grew up. Maybe it was true 80 years ago. Maybe it's true even 25 years ago. But in many ways, you and I are not the home team. We watch the news. We feel like strangers. We say, that's not the country I grew up in. And, you know, I feel like I'm now the visiting team. I'm not in charge. The people that agree with me are not in charge anymore. And how do we learn to live in a world like that? Now, let me encourage you just a little bit this morning. If you feel like you're not the home team, you feel like you're the people who agree with you are not in charge, if you feel like you know, you're a stranger in this culture, the Bible says and always has said that for people, the people of God, that we are alien strangers in this world. For most Christians in most of Christian history, it has been the case that they're not in charge that they are in many ways aliens and strangers and they feel like it. So if we feel like it, it's not something that's strange and unusual. It's how Christians have learned to live throughout most of the history of our faith. And can I say this much? That in many places for the Christians who, who live in that location, that country, that nation, are not in charge, where they're not the home team, where they feel like strangers and aliens, the gospel is exploding in those places. God can use His people no matter what place they live or time they live. But God's people always need to understand the place they live and the time they live and the choices they have to make in order to live effectively as God's people in that place and that time. And so this morning as we look in the book of Acts in the 20th chapter, I want to talk for a few minutes about how we learn the place and the time we live in. And if you want to put it in a term that everybody understands, I would say it this way. How do we learn to be missionaries? Now, for most of my life, when I said the word missionary, I was talking about somebody who went somewhere else. I might be talking about somebody who sold all his belongings and moved to Africa or moved to Asia. You know, I think of a missionary as somebody who lives somewhere else. But when you wake up one morning, you realize, you know, the people around me don't understand me. The people around me don't agree with me. The people around me don't take their values from the same place that I do, the Word of God. You know, the truth is, whatever we want to call it, we have now become missionaries. Missionaries in our own country. How do we learn to do that? Now, it's, this is, I think, not just for New Holland Baptist Church, but for churches all over America. This is the challenge of the day. This is the moment when God's people need to learn to flip a switch inside their heads and realize the world around us has changed. God has not changed. And God is calling us to make a difference in the world we live in now. How do we learn to be missionaries. Now in the 20th chapter of Acts, the reason I want to look at that this morning is that we see there a story where Paul is speaking to the elders of the church of Ephesus. Paul's on his way back to Jerusalem. He's in a hurry to get there. He doesn't want to go into Ephesus and be caught up there for several weeks. And so he asked the elders to come and meet him in a little town called Miletus. And, and he's going through a history of what he did there in that town at Ephesus. When Paul arrived at Ephesus, it was years ago before this story, when Paul arrived there, he didn't know it was soul. When Paul came to Ephesus for the first time, nobody there was a Christian. Nobody would have agreed with him about what was true and what was good and what was right. He was a stranger like you and I may feel like we're strangers. 
some of us in our own families. But by the time Paul left Ephesus, the people he's speaking to here had come to understand the value of what Paul believed. And by the, by the time he left Ephesus, they had become believers in Jesus. God used him in a powerful way as a missionary. And as he outlines and talks about how that worked and what he did, there are lessons for us. If we ask the question today, how do we learn to pivot? How do we learn to become missionaries in a country that used to feel like home, but no longer does? How can we become missionaries? I think there are clues here for all of us. So let me ask you, and let's, let's all stand as we read the Word of God this morning, the 20th chapter of Acts, beginning in the 17th verse. The Bible says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, by the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly to the gospel of the grace of God. Thank you. You can be seated. How do we learn to do what the Apostle Paul did in that city and had such an effect on the lives of people? How do we have an effect on the lives of people around us, the people we work with, who may not see the world the way we do, People around our dinner table at Thanksgiving who maybe 10 years ago all of your family would have seen the world through the same lens, but now they don't. How do we learn to be missionaries? Well, I think one of the things we learn to do and we have to make sure we do in this world we live in now is to tell the people around us the whole truth. And if you listen to what the Apostle Paul said, listen to what he says here. He, he says in verse 20, he says, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Now that's an interesting turn of phrase. Anything that was profitable. If you look on down a few verses, you'll see where he talks about the whole counsel of God. Not part of the counsel of God, not whatever is palatable for that day, but the whole counsel of God. You know, a tennis fan or not, maybe there's somebody here who likes to play tennis, but if, if there is a tennis fan in the house this morning, you might remember, uh, it's been a year and a half ago, September of 2022, U.S. Open, uh, Serena Williams was playing her last match in the U.S. Open. Now, Serena Williams is a tremendous tennis player. And as she was, you know, her swan song and basically, you know, her final match, the, the commentators and that whole tournament were talking about how wonderful a tennis player she was. And she has been. I mean, she has tremendous, you know, uh, records and all this kind of stuff. And they talked about whether or not she was the greatest of all time and on and on and on. It's like so much so that you don't remember who won the tournament. You just remember about Serena Williams. And that's fine. I mean, she earned all those accolades. But it's interesting that in that, if you watched that, and it's been a little while ago, so maybe I don't know that you remember it. But one of the names you probably didn't hear much about in that tournament while they were giving all these accolades to Serena Williams is you didn't probably hear the name Margaret Court. Now, if you've followed tennis a long time, you remember the name Margaret Court from back in the 70s. Margaret Court actually won more 
Grand Slam titles than Serena Williams did. And she did it in a far you know, less amount of seven fewer years she played professionally and won more Grand Slam titles than Serena Williams, but she was hardly even mentioned. Why is that? I'll tell you why it is. Margaret Court is an opponent of same-sex marriage. Back in her home country of Australia, you're talking about taking her name off the Margaret Court arena in the city of Melbourne Park just because she believes things and says things that are not popular. I mean, it's not hard to see in today's world how, how tempting it is for people to shrink back. I read these words where Paul says, I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable. And this temptation to shrink back because it costs something to tell people the truth, the whole truth, everything that's profitable. This temptation to shrink back even shows up at church sometimes. Now, praise God, it's not the case here. But there are churches where they do shrink back, where they do not tell the whole truth truth. Now, before you just assume that's because somebody is afraid to do it, it's not necessarily the case. Sometimes a preacher says, you know, I'm not going to talk about this in this sermon because he, he's trying to leave the door open. He knows I got lost people coming today and they don't look at the world the same way we do. He wants to leave the door open to share the gospel. He doesn't want to offend them right out the gate. And you may be thinking, well, what's wrong with that? And I would say on a given day, probably nothing. But there's everything wrong with that if it becomes a habit. There's everything wrong with that if we never tell the whole truth. There's everything wrong with that if we shrink back. Can I just say, you know what? That preacher who may be able to say, well, I'm, I'm not going to talk about this topic on this particular day. I mean, he has that freedom. He has that choice to avoid some topics. But that mom and dad in that church who's raising a 13-year-old girl whose friends are decided they're another gender, they don't have the freedom to avoid that topic. They got to deal with that topic. The young people who are growing up in your church, they have to deal with that topic. It's real in their life. It's something they interact with at school all the time. And my question to these pastors is, are you going to help them or not? There is this idea that people, somebody somewhere has adopted that if you love people, you'll shrink back. I think the opposite is true. Paul said, I did not shrink back. He was a missionary. Do you? Can I just say to you this morning, nobody in that town agreed with him. Nobody. Nobody would have called themselves a Christian. Nobody. He didn't have an automatic agreement for anything he was going to say. There was going to be disagreement on all kinds of things. But Paul said, I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Folks, you know, when my dad was alive, and my, my dad died in 2015, <laughs> can I just say, my dad did not shrink back <laughs> from telling me what he thought. <laughs> and I'd talk to him sometimes, and I would walk out of that room, woo! <laughs> you know? It's like it singed the hair off my eyebrows. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> I didn't agree with him all the time. But since he's been gone, I have realized what a blessing it is to have somebody in my life who I know is not going to shrink back. Whether I want to hear it, whether I don't want to hear it, whether I agree with it, whether I don't want to agree with it, because he loved me, he was going to tell me the truth with the bark on. <laughs> he was not going to shrink back. And people in our culture need to know that when they come to God's house, that they're going to hear the truth, not some spun version of the truth, not some sort of airbrushed version of the truth. They need to know there's a place where somebody loves them enough that they're not going to give them the spin. They're going to give them the truth, the whole truth. That's how we learn to be missionaries. 
And can I just say too, it's like, if you don't give somebody the truth, if my, my dad gave me the truth because he loved me, whether I agree with it or not, and when we choose not to give people the truth, it either means that we don't love them or we don't believe it. I did not shrink back. Now this is not just about what happens at church. I know the hard thing for many of us is that we have these issues going on at work. People who don't agree with us. We have these issues in our own family. People who, who violently disagree with us. You know, we have deep divisions sometimes we have to navigate. And I'm not saying that you should ever speak the truth in anything but love. But I am saying that you can't affirm everybody for everything they do if you love them. A missionary doesn't do that. What else? A Paul said, you know, I, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. I'm going to tell you the whole truth. Whatever's going to help you. He also said, and I think this is something we need to learn from Paul, we need to tell the whole truth and we need to use the whole playbook. Now, y'all, I've said this before, I don't know if you remember, but I'm, I'm a Georgia fan. I'm a big Georgia fan. I can remember a day, now nowadays it's not the case, but I can remember a day maybe back when Herschel Walker was playing there or whatever, when Vince Dooley was the coach. It's a long time ago now. I can remember a day when Georgia was very predictable when it came to the offense. I mean, if they threw a pass, it was like, wow. <laughs> it was like every play looked like right between the tackles. And sometimes they'd be winning, sometimes they'd be losing, but it was like they would always run the same play. I would watch them play the game and I would say, can you not do, can you not run a different play? It's like they're stuck in a rut. They only had one, you know, two or three plays. It's like they're just stuck in a rut. And I think, can you not run it? Can you not use the whole playbook? See, I think at church sometimes we get stuck in a rut. And we think that everything that matters or how we connect with the world, the difference we're going to make in the world is what the plays we can run on Sunday morning. So it's all about, it's all about how awesome the sermon is. All about how wonderful the music is, and, and today's music was. It's all about how clean the carpet is. It's all about how, you know, how seamless the technology is. I and mean, it's all about, you name it, one thing after another. It's like all things that have to do with Sunday morning. And I'm not here this morning to say we shouldn't run that play. Those things matter. But when I read what the Apostle Paul said, He said, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you, listen, publicly, that Sunday morning, and from house to house. He didn't just run one play. You know, several years ago, I was talking to a worship pastor in a different church who told me, he basically told me his his story, his testimony, he said he grew up in Kentucky, rural Kentucky, in a place that was uh, a mile from any paved road. Okay, get that in your head. I mean, this place, his family was isolated. They lived not a mile from any paved road and a good distance from any neighbor. I mean, it's, it's not as, as if they were just, you know, hobnobbing with everybody at night, you know, in the, in the cul-de-sac in their neighborhood. It's like they were isolated. And he's standing out in his yard one day when he was a young kid, just about to go into middle school. And the stranger comes into his front yard. Turns out it was the preacher at the nearest Baptist church who had taken it upon himself, this preacher, not just to sit in his office and come up with awesome sermons. This preacher had decided that he was going to get to know every family in his community, even if it meant getting... A, a mile off of every paved road and finding where people live so that he could get in their front yard, invite them to church. He invited this young man to church. His name was Terry Williams. He's over at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. Terry's family didn't go to church. 
Terry's family would, it wouldn't have mattered how great the sermons were on Sunday morning. It wouldn't have mattered how great the technology was. None of that would have mattered. They didn't go to church. They never would have gone to church. And some preacher, praise God, decided that rather than just running one play, rather than just sitting in his office and coming up with an awesome sermon that folks could hear. He was going to go house to house. He was going to get to know every human being that lived within his community and find out if they knew Jesus. And he asked Terry Adams if he would come to church. Terry said, okay, I'll come. And he ended up trusting Jesus as his Savior. Of the 10 boys that that preacher was able to get into this Sunday school class for middle school boys, five of them, would end up, not only were they saved, they went into full-time ministry. I mean, can you imagine what would happen in our world if we could run more than one play? If we didn't just worry about what happens on Sunday morning? And I'm not talking here either about what preachers are supposed to do. I'm talking about what regular folks can do. What would happen if you adopted every family on your street? What would happen if your Sunday school class said, we're going to adopt every family on this street, every widow that needs somebody to change a light bulb, every, every young couple that not from here doesn't have anybody to keep their kids, every elderly couple that needs somebody to cut their grass. We're not going to run just this. We're not going to be the people who just come on Sunday morning and, and spectators and give our tithe, go home. We're going to adopt a ministry approach that touches house to house. What would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. It would open doors for the gospel like we've never seen. Because God's people, and it's not just true. It, it, what's happening here is, is, like I say, missionaries. Becoming missionaries is the way God's people have always had to do it. And when you and I learn to become missionaries... Not only spectators on Sunday morning, but missionaries who love the people around us in tangible ways that they can't account for. It'll open doors for the gospel like we've never seen. You know, we don't have to despair about changes that are happening in America today. We just need to pivot. We need to tell people the whole truth. We need to use the whole playbook. We need to love the whole community. The whole community. You know, you read these words, Paul said, I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you both publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks. Let me stop there. You know, if you read on from Acts chapter 20, the next couple of chapters, 21, 22, you'll find a story there where Paul gets back to Jerusalem. And when he gets back to Jerusalem, he goes to the temple. And in the temple, he's praying. And some of these Jews that he has mentioned in this passage who give him a hard time everywhere, they drag him out of the temple. They are beating him to a pulp out in front of the temple because they think he has somehow compromised the law of God which he hasn't, but that's what they've got in their heads. They're beating the snot out of him right outside the temple. And some of these soldiers come down and they rescue him and they disrupt the process. And they're dragging Paul away to save his life. And as they do, Paul, I don't know if I would have done this, but, but uh, this was the Apostle Paul, pretty much an amazing guy. He says to the soldier, let me talk to the people. And the centurion, the soldier in charge, says, well, all right. So Paul gets up and he begins to give his testimony. It's, you'll find it there in the 22nd chapter of Acts. And he begins to talk about how God, how Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And he talks about how, how he had been going to Damascus to drag those people back to Jerusalem, people who were disobeying the law, at least from his perspective. And as Paul goes through that, everything's going pretty good. I mean, the people are listening to him. Until he gets to the part where God says to him, Go. Verse 21 in the 22nd chapter, Paul says, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. 
Now, you watch the news today, these days, you ever see situations where a single word, people are so divided. People have become so used to hating each other that nowadays a single word will trigger a riot. I mean, you say the word Israel in the wrong context, it triggers a riot. Now, you say the word Trump in any context, <laughs> it, it triggers, it triggers a, you know, deep disagreements and anger and hatred. And, or you say the word Biden. I mean, any of these, it's like we understand what it's like to be in a world that's so divided. We can't even talk to each other. So Paul is, is giving his testimony and everything's going pretty good until he says this one word, go for I'll send you to the Gentiles. And if you read the text, it says immediately, just hearing the word, just hearing the word, these people are triggered. They begin to riot. They say, away with him. He doesn't deserve to live. And this is a picture of how divided we think our world's divided. This is a picture of how divided Paul, Paul's world was. All he had to do was say the word, and they were ready to kill him. So now read these words, what Paul said he did. He said, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks. Paul wanted the gospel to go to the whole community. Everybody. You say, what does that look like for us? If we're missionaries where we live, what does it look like? One thing it means is we, we do not, as God's people, we may have strong feelings about this issue or that issue that's being debated in the, in the government or or that's coming up on this election that's going to be in a few months. We may have strong, deep feelings about it. And we may live in a world where people hate each other and cancel each other immediately. Cancel each other on social media, cancel each other in terms of relations. We won't even talk to you at work if you disagree. I, I get it. We can't do that. What does it look like to love the whole community? The whole community. Not tell them the whole truth. Use the whole playbook. Love the whole community. What does it look like? It means we do not cancel people who disagree with us. Well, we didn't mean we have to agree with them. It doesn't mean we have to affirm them. And they may, on their part, cancel us if we don't affirm them. That's their choice. But we do not cancel people because they disagree with us in any, whatever the issue is. They have value to God. Christ died for every person, whether they are a Democrat or Republican, whether they are marching in a pride parade or, or sitting in a Baptist church on a Sunday morning. It's like they have value to God, they have value to us. And we treat them that way. What does it look like to be a missionary? It means we are gracious, we are hospitable, we're kind to everybody, even if they disagree with us, whatever the issue is. It means that we are hospitable, we value people if they speak a different language, if they come from a different place. Jesus died for all these people. We tell the whole truth. We use the whole playbook, not just Sunday morning but house to house, our whole neighborhood. We love the whole community. It matters to us. We want to find a way to testify and care about everybody in the community we live in. Whether it's on Sunday morning or any other time. Because they matter to God. And the last thing I would say is, not just the whole truth, the whole playbook, the whole community, but your and my whole heart. Paul said in this passage, verse 22, And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, that bond, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course 
and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel and the grace of God. Verse 22, he says, bound by the Spirit. Your version may say constrained by the Spirit. Have you ever been constrained, bound internally by something that you could not set aside I mean, to be constrained by something, it becomes a have-to in your life. To be constrained by something, it's a, it's a must. You can't just ignore it. You, you can't you shut your eyes at night, it's still there. You, you cannot stop thinking about it, planning for it. You can't lay it down and walk away from it. It's like the coach at Georgia Tech may say <laughs> this year, you know, I've got to beat Georgia. It's constrained by it, or it's like, you know, somebody says uh, they're halfway through a college degree and tempted to quit. They say, I have got to finish this thing or I have got to get this promotion. Or, God bless them, maybe this, the parents of this little Hispanic girl who's abducted recently here in town and say, I got to. Paul says, I'm bound, bound by the Spirit. He explains it later in verse 24. He says, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the grace of God. You know, that's the mission of New Holland Baptist Church, to testify solemnly to the grace of God, the gospel of the grace of God. We may not be the home team in America today. We may not be in charge of who wins an election or how the politics go or even what the Supreme Court decisions are. We, we may not be in charge of any of that. God's people very seldom have been in Christian history. But our mission is still the same. To finish our course, to be bound by something, to, to give it our whole heart as God's people, to testify solemnly to the gospel of grace of God by telling our culture, our neighbors, the people we work with, our family members, the whole truth. Whatever's profitable, won't shrink back. By using the whole playbook, not just Sunday morning, but house to house. By caring about the whole community. Even if we live in a world that is so divided that lots of people will just cancel anybody that is different. We don't. We care about the whole community and we give this our whole heart. 